Thank you everybody for coming back today uh, for Ava's uh, second talk. Um, so again, this is part of the Steenbach lecture series. Um, and these are uh, held in uh, memorial of uh, Harry Steenbach, uh, who was a professor here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, through his work on vitamin D research and, uh, and patenting that, pro uh, that intellectual property, um, he raised a, a fairly significant amount of money to help found the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, uh, which has provided uh, the funds for uh, this, this lecture series. Um, so these funds include the Steenbach Research Lectures, um, as well as funding for the Steenbach Library, uh, endowed, professors, endowed professorships, uh, and startup funds uh, for new professors. Um, so we are thrilled to welcome back uh, Ava Nagalis for her second talk today. Um, I'm going to briefly reintroduce Ava, um, uh, hitting a lot of the points that we talked about yesterday. So uh, she did her PhD at uh, Keele University in the UK uh, with uh, Joan Bordas. Uh, she then did a postdoc at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory with uh, Kenneth Downing. Um, and then she became an assistant professor at UC Berkeley where she has remained since. Uh, she is currently a full professor of biochemistry, biophysics, and structural biology at UC Berkeley, and a senior faculty scientist in molecular biophysics and integrated bioimaging at LBNL. Uh, she is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a Bio biophysical society fellow, and a, society, and a fellow of the American Society for Cell Biology. Um, so we are thrilled today for Ava's talk, Regulatory Mechanisms of Polycomb Repressive Complex II in Gene Silencing. Ava. Thank you, Robert, and thank you again uh, for um, allowing me to give these, these lectures. I'm honored, and it's been um, two days and still more to come of very stimulating talk, uh, talks to faculty and students and hearing about all the wonderful science that is going on uh, right here. So, um, so thank you very much for making me uh, a participant. So yeah, today I'm, I'm going to... Um, tell you a, sec a second story within the theme in my lab that uh, concerns gene expression regulation. In this case, uh, telling you about the silencing complex polycomb repressive uh, complex two. Um, so polycomb is, um, is an essential complex to establish and maintain cell identity. So very critical during development, but also during the life of the adult organism where um, mis misexpression, wrong expression levels or mutation can give rise to loss of that identity and actually contribute to, um, to cancer. Uh, so PRC2 is actually a major target uh, as an anti-cancer therapeutic. Um, the complex function by modifying uh, um, Chromatin, it trimethylates histone 27, uh, sorry, lysine 27 in histone H3. And this uh, modification um, downstream uh, ultimately leads to chromatin compaction and gene silencing. So the complex has four core subunits um, of which ECH2 is the one that has the methyl transferase uh, activity. And another one is ED, this, is, this acts as a reader of that same modification and then allosterically activate ECH2. And it's thought that this is likely to contribute to the spreading of, uh, of this modification to extensive regions of, of the genome. And there's also uh, SUS12 and RBAP46 or 48. They also, this one also comes by other names. In any case, these four core subunits um, are thought to never be alone uh, in the cell. They interact with other factors, the core factors, to give rise to two different modalities, main modalities of PRC2. And the one that we study, sometimes referred to as PRC2.2, has as protein cofactors ABP2 and JARET2. So this, this, um, these proteins actually contribute to the regulation of the activity of the complex that thought to maybe also play roles um, in the localization in, in the genome and, um, um, and therefore contribute generally to the activity and, and, and place of activity of the complex. Um, 
The other players very important in the regulation had to do with histone modifications. I already mentioned that the uh, trimethylated lysine 27 in H3 that PRC2 deposits is, um, is itself an activator of the complex, but uh, the complex can read other, um, other modifications. I'll tell you about a couple of them uh, that also regulate um, either increase or, or, or decrease its activity. So the joint effects of protein cofactors and histone modification can give rise to an activation of PRC2, uh, which um, leads to more of this modification and compaction and silencing, or it can give rise to an inhibition of the complex, which then allow for more open chromatin uh, in regions that would therefore be uh, transcriptionally active. So, um, of course, uh, as I told you uh, yesterday, we use CryEM as a major methodology where the purified complexes are quickly fro uh, frozen, thin and frozen um, into a, th a thin layer in which they remain in a hydrated state. I have to tell you, when we started working on PRC2, um, PRC2 was too small to be studied um, by cryoEM is 300 kilodaltons right now is laughable, but at the time um, it was really borderline of what was considered to be uh, doable. So when Claudio Ciferi was a postdoc uh, in the lab, he now heads the structural biology department at Genentech here in the Bay Area. Um, he actually started the studies in PRC2 and um, he overexpressed the four core subunits in insect cells, and he found that the complex was really, really flexible, and uh, we consider it untractable for, for structural studies. But of course, he knew about these uh, cofactors, and what he did was to add one more protein, and this that was ABP2, and this had a significant effect in the stability of the complex. I'll show you why uh, in a minute. And he used negative stain um, to characterize it, and he was able to obtain a, a very lovely structure at 20 angstrom resolution. Now, if you look at the, at the schematic of the structure, uh, structural domain in the different subunits, you will see that both ED and RBAP48 are WD40 domains that at 20, astroms, uh, 20 angstrom resolution look like donuts. And there were two of those uh, in the structure. So that meant that out of that, that structure that he, he had produced, those two had to correspond to those two, pro likely to correspond to those two proteins, but which one was which and what was the meaning of the rest of the, of the complex at this resolution, what could we tell? But um, Claudio was very resourceful. He had a, an expression, a hydrologous expression system, so he could play with, the system, with it. And this is what he decided to do. He decided to systematically place one at a time a label like either an MBP on the NOC terminus or a GFP in, in places between domains or between uh, secondary structure elements within domains, a GFP, in order to then compare it with the Y type, see the position of this extra density and therefore uh, get an idea of where the defensive units were located. So this, this is the idea. This, we don't do this anymore, but it was really amazing what he did at the time. So this is this, uh, this uh, just two-dimensional projection. If you concentrate on this one, for example, this is the Y type. This is the equivalent projection, the same direction of view, but with a GFP that has been placed between the first and the second blade of the beta propeller of ED. And you see this extra density, also you can see it here, you can see it in the difference map that, uh, map that allowed him to actually position uh, this, uh, that subunit and that particular place uh, with respect to the, 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 the three-dimensional structure. He, you know, he did this very systematically. In this case, he moved through the blades. This, for example, is a GFP between the uh, last and one to last. And it is in the same region, but it's in a slightly different position. We could even place, do a docking of the beta propeller, orienting it uh, angularly, because he was able to, to 
to place the GFP at, 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 between different places. I thought it was truly amazing. So doing this sick, systematically, he was able to paint the different regions of the complex with the different domains. And at the point, there was only um, structures, I believe, for one of the WD-40 domains. For the others, the, the sum domains, the set domain, there were uh, models that we could use for homology. And just they were placed in the structure just as a placeholder. Um, but basically, this gave us an architecture of all the different subunits were in the complex that I'm, I'm going so much about because it turned out to be spot on. So it tells you when you do the right experiments and you're resourceful and tenacious, what you can uh, do even when the technology is, is, is still uh, limited. By the way, I don't want to forget, we corroborated this structure, um, collaborating with Rudy Eversol, uh, doing uh, cross-linking mass spectroscopy to make sure that what we were doing actually makes sense by something that was a completely orthogonal method. This is something that we've done for many other structures, um, for TF2D, uh, for the risk chromatin remodeling complex, or, or for even higher structure, higher resolution structures of, of PRCT. Yeah, very beautifully complementary when your resolution is still not so, so very high that you want to use something else unrelated to corroborate it. Okay, so since we published that structure in 2012, um, not a lot happened for a while until uh, at the end of 2015, beginning of 2016, two fantastic crystallographic studies came first uh, on a fungi and then on the human um, uh, complex. Uh, that included what we have identified at the top lobe of the complex, which turned out to be the minimal unit for biochemical um, activity, both methyl transferase, but also uh, allosteric regulation. And that includes all of ECH2, um, uh, ED, and part of SUS12. So sorry. So that element and just the, with these two full subunits, the, the, the one with the catalytic site, the one with the allosteric site, and the very C-terminal VEBS domain of SUS12 form a unit, that functional unit that was crystallized. And this, this is the structure. Um, and one of the things that was very interesting is that they were able to obtain the structure bound to a histone pe peptide that had been trimethylated in lysine 27 bound to the allosteric site of the WD40 domain of ED. And they saw that this activating peptide um, resulted in the stabilization of a segment that is invisible otherwise, uh, but that falls as an alpha helix on top of the peptide and the ED uh, that they call the stimulatory response motif or SRM. And this in turn interacts with um, one of the helix in the set domain and give rise to an optimally um, a structured active site to receive um, a peptide and, and modified in the active site. Okay, so this this was um, this was the structural information that we have at the time. And then Vignesh Kasinath, who I realized uh, yesterday talking to people was here not too long ago presenting uh, a big part of this, the, of what I'm gonna be telling you today. So today you should really, really end up learning a lot about PRC2 by hearing the same things a couple of times. So Vignesh decided he wanted to get the full complex and the full complex meaning the full PRC 2.2 with the two activators, ABP2 and Jarrett2. So again, he used an insect overexpression system to produce uh, this, these proteins. And he made progress, but he was for a long time stuck in the limbo of about four and a half angstrom where the, the regions that were novel were still not tra uh, traceable. And what ultimately did it um, was the use of a of the Volta faceplate. This is one of the very few cases where the Volta faceplate has been used for an ab initial structure determination of something. Um, another one was our study on human TF2H, 
and there's not very many more because um, this is the Volta faceplate is very hard to use. And when it comes to really small things, it turns out that it's better to just use 200 kV scopes and, and get done with it. In any case, um, one of the things that I also want to, have, so this is how the data looks like. The contrast is unbelievable with the faceplate when it does work. The, the sample had to be cross-link and uh, deposited on a carbon surface because this complex otherwise breaks apart. So it's one of these complexes that really gets damaged at the air-water interface, which is an infinite hydrophobic sink, and it can compete for hydrophobic interactions in complexes or even lead to unfolding of proteins. So we had to both cross-link it and we use BS3, the same cross-linker that we use for the mass spec studies in very, very small amounts. So very lightly cross-link um, and a carbon support that again allows for the adherence of the complex to that surface so that it's less likely that it diffuses away and contacts the air-water interface. In any case, um, using that, using focus classification of the type that I of the type that I told you about yesterday, um, he was able to get a, a structure about 3.5 angstrom resolution, and this was enough to not only be able to um, use the initial structures from uh, crystallography and then um, adjust them, but also to uh, for the top lobe, but also to generate the full structure the structure of the of the bottom lobe that was unknown until then. Now, in this structure, he did not add any histone peptide, but it's a structure that is activated. And it's activated because it turns out that Jarrett 2, this cofactor, is itself a substrate for ECH2. And it gets modified, and the trimethylated peptide, that part of the protein, binds to the allosteric site in EED and activates the complex, okay? So what you see here is an activated peptide. It's not added, it's just there from the prep. These subunits are co-expressed in insect cells where all, all the chemistry is there for the methyl transferase activity to occur. And when we purify it, uh, Jarrett 2 is, uh, is methylated. And it has bound to the, to the complex. Okay, um, so actually, um, Vignesh didn't see one structure, he actually saw two different structures that coexisted in our biochemical um, preparation. And um, these two states differ on the position of this domain, which is the sun domain that comes after the sun binding domain, this, uh, this helix, this SBD helix, um, ca that can be either straight or bent, and when it's bent, the sun domain tucks in, and when it's not, it's, it's sticking out. So this is an orthogonal view of that. To tell you um, also that here, you, you, you see the sun domain done with this helix bend. What you see here in magenta is the stimulating peptide that in this case comes from Jarrett 2. What you see in yellow here is the SRN that has been stabilized and has um, folded. And, and the, um, I'll, I'll tell you in a second, but the, um, the active side is in an active conformation. Um, so the, these are just details of, of the peptide and the trimethylated lysine surrounded by the classical uh, hydrophobic cage, being recognized by this hydrophobic cage. But in addition, he sees this structure, this extended active conformation with this helix straight, the sand one, uh, in the breeze, and it does have an, a, a stimulating peptide, but we don't see the SRM. So the SRM is not folded over the peptide. However, the active, the, the site is also in an active conformation. In any case, this is the same region where you can, as, again, see the activating peptide. Um, so this is telling us that there's an equilibrium uh, between an SRM that is fold, folded and unfolded and somehow under our conditions, it correlates, seem to correlate with having this region up or down. Okay, so bent SPD, presence of SRM, straight SPD, no SRM uh, visible. Uh, and just so that, you know, um, we, 
we can, this was just a control where we express a Jarrett 2 um, that is shorter. So the, the, the lysine that is methylated is 116. So if we, if we generate a construct that is shorter, um, then it doesn't have um, that residue and it is not, um, that there's no, nothing occupying the allosteric site and concomitantly we see nothing occupying the active site, which is, is not in the right conformation, which otherwise for the other two active, we see engage also with, with substrate peptide. Okay, so uh, I just want to concentrate on one more feature of this structure. And this was the fact that we saw a part of ABP2, ABP2 is predicted to have a couple of small folding domains, a lot of long linkers, and this is the region that we saw binding to the complex. And I want you to see how it binds right at the interface between the top and bottom lobe, um, which is the other ones that are very flexible in its absence, but in its presence, it's like a staple that keeps the two, uh, the two halves uh, closer, you know, tighter uh, together. By the way, I'm not gonna show you this, but the interface, um, between the top and bottom lobe is really dominated by a hydrophobic patch. And we believe that this is the, there's some breathing still in the structure and this hydrophobic patch tend to be competed away by the air water interface that unravels SUS 12 and then uh, RBAP 48 falls off. Um, and this is the way the, the complex breaks. And I'm gonna show you that broken complex in a second for a reason that will be up. Uh, that I would explain. In any case, um, the other the the surprise. So we we expect we expected that ABP two were going to be here because it's stabilizing. It is the most likely way you you serve as a glue yourself um, so to to the regions that are mobile. But something that came as a surprise is that there's a part of uh, of um, of ABP two that actually that we see very well and that binds to the WD40 domain of the RBAP48. And this domain had been shown before biochemically and through a crystal structure to bind unmethylated um, H3 uh, by, the, by lysine K4. Um, I'm gonna be telling you about K4 later on. In an unmodified state, this WD40 domain binds it with, with uh, reasonable affinity. And what we see is that ABP2 can mimic the binding on that site. So interestingly, both cofactors are mimicking histones. Jarrett 2 mimics a K27 trimethylated histone and activates the complex binding to the allosteric site. While ABP2 binds to a site that normally recognizes unmethylated K4, um, the reason for it, we actually don't know what the function it is, but it's, it's just an um, amazing uh, coincidence that both of them are able to, uh, to play these roles. Um, so once we have this, the structure of the complex, the obvious thing was, can we see it bound to is template, which are which is which is nucleosomes, and in, in particular, you know, the first study that we did was not for a mononucleosome; it was for a dinucleosome, because we wanted to get hopefully some information about how spreading may occur in in a in a structural context. So this is the idea. The idea, so this is, was the work of Simon Popsel when he was a postdoc in my lab. Now he has his own at the University of Cologne in, in Germany. The idea is let's work with a dinucleosome where one of the nucleosomes has already been modified. It's already trimethylated on K27. So it can serve as an allosteric activator of the complex. And then the one next door will be unmethylated and could serve as a substrate. So the idea is that Part of the a spreading mechanism could involve PRC2 engaging both simultaneously and the activation of one nucleosome will therefore promote the, um, the methylation of the one next to it. So he, uh, Simon generated these two types of nucleosomes, then he ligated them to generate the dinucleosome. And then he first tested whether PRC2 was binding 
to the dinucleosome in the way that we, we expected. Um, and this is, this is the result. Um, I hope you can see very clearly comparing the PRC2 by itself and the PRC2 with the dinucleosome that we, we can see both uh, two nucleosomes engaged simultaneously with, with one complex. So this was great. So it was the time to move to cryo. And here came the problem. The problem was that this complex could not be cross-linked. If we cross-link the complex, uh, the complex comes apart. And we see that both by negative state or by gel shift. Mm, so somehow the uh, cross-linking is incompatible. We understand now why the contacts are happening mostly between lysine and nucleosomal DNA. And those lysines were being titrated away by the cross-linker. And, um, and this also told us, because this is a problem, even after we form the complex and we can see it, it just tells us that these contacts, um, there has to be a certain off rate, and this, th these things are coming on and off, that the lysis can be competed away by the cross-linker that binds to during the off state and then do not allow for any further rebinding. So he also could not use a carbon support because when he did the geometry of the complex with the two nucleosomes was such that he only got one view. So he had to bite the bullet and do cryem without the carbon and without the crosslinker where we knew the, the, um, the complex was gonna be affected. And, and, uh, and this is what we could do at the time. Uh, so we did it and we could see the two nucleosomes and the top half of the complex, which we know from negative staining is the part that binds the nucleosomes anyway, but the bottom half was disappearing. And that's what I was telling you uh, before. He still went ahead. He obtained a beautiful a structure about seven, eight Armstrong resolution where he could take the structures that we have for the top lobe and the Luger structure for the nucleosome, model the linker DNA and get a structure of how the uh, PRC2 contacted the, uh, the nucleosomes. There was certain flexibility here. That's why the resolution uh, is not very good. This, these are just two of the most extreme classes um, that are superimposed on PRC2 and show certain motion in what is, we know, I'll tell you in a second, is the substrate nucleosome and really quite dramatic motion in the modified nucleosome that serves an, as an allosteric activator. By the way, you know, to start with, when I saw this structure, it was, it was beautiful, but we thought, is this a coincidence that we use the right, you know, how lucky were we choosing the length of the, of the linker DNA that these two things can engage with each other? So we, we changed the linker length to 30 to 40, the complex is still binds. Whether it binds with exactly the same affinity probably is slightly different, but is able to do it. And for that, it relies on the fact that there's two H3s per nucleosome, so it can flip the nucleosome, like in this case, it flipped with respect to one another, it flipped this nucleosome, it's engaging a different H3, but also with this flexibility that exists um, that gives you a little also leeway um, in the angle and therefore the length of the linker DNA. So um, how are these uh, two nucleosomes being engaged? So first of all, let me tell you about the tails because that's how we know which one is which and they're doing what we expect them to do. This nucleosome is the modified nucleosome. We can see the modified tail um, bound to the allosteric site. By the way, this is a five subunit component. There's no Jared 2 ABP2 is there, um, but Jared 2 is not there. In this case, Jared 2 is not the one that is activating the complex. It is the modified nucleosome that is activating the complex, okay? Um, and on the other hand, we see the nucleosome and we see the tail making it all the way to the um, active site in the set domain. But most of the binding energy doesn't come from the tails. It comes from interacting with the nucleosomal DNA. 
So, so this is how the nucleosome, and I'm just showing again the, the range of motion at which it can be engaged is pivots with respect to the contact point. Um, the modified nucleosome interacts with the ED and with this SBD, this long helix that then leads to the SAN1 domain. Remember this, this is a straight helix. This helix is straight in a straight form engages this nucleosome. Uh, it would not have the same contact uh, if it was bent, okay? On the other hand, um, it was in the previous slide, the SRM, I wanna show you, um, the SRM is perfectly stabilized. So this is a mixture in the presence of a nucleosome, this is a mixture of the state that we saw before, one with a straight SBD and a sun domain that is up and detached, but that has a stabilized SRM. Okay, um, sorry. And then, uh, so that's the, that's the contact of the, aloster, uh, of the allosteric uh, nucleosome, the one that activates. This is the substrate nucleosome that is proximal to the set domain and where the DNA is being contacted by the CXC domain proximal to the set domain within ECH2. And in both cases, um, there are very nicely defined um, positively charged regions that interact with the, the two gyres of the, of the nucleosome in the case of the, of the allosteric pre-modified nucleosome. And with the, with the two, you can follow nicely the two strands of the one jar of DNA that interacts um, with next to the active site. Um, all right, so, so this was great. It was a medium resolution structure that we could interpret with previous either crystal structures of our own. But there was one element that was unexplained. So if you turn this around the way I did, there is an extra density that sits on a really prime position between the PRC2, the ECH2, the nucleosomal DNA, and the histone tail in its way to the active side. And this density is shown at two different thresholds. One that shows the density is very strong. Um, the second threshold in, in white is so that you can see more or less the path of the of the peptide of the of the histone tail. Um, so this is it seems like a very strategic position. It's even more so because what you see there is an with an asterisk is K36. This is another lysine that gets trimethylated by a different complex and is inhibitory, have been show, show, uh, shown to be inhibitory uh, for PRC2 activity. So what is that? I'll get to that in a, in a second. All right, so, but I, I want to go back to, the, to this issue of the histone modifications. So there's modifications that are associated with active transcription that are inhibitory to PRC2, that's trimethylation of K4 and trimethylation of K36. Uh, this has been shown in the context of the core complex, which is by the way, very poor, have very poor enzymatic activity to be inhibitory. On the other hand, there is the uh, H3K27 trimethylation, the self uh, modification that is actually allosterically activates the complex. And there is another modification, um, which is the mono of lysine 119 in histone H2A. This is a modification that is introduced but the other major polycon complex, polycon uh, repressive complex one. And once this modification is introduced, um, PRC2 has been proposed to be recruited by that modification to, site, to site modified sites in the genome, then deposit the modification that I've been telling you about. And this is itself recognized by a slightly different form of PRC1 that then gets further recruited to the site. And it's thought that that PRC1 has the capacity to itself contribute to the condensation of, of chromatin. So we decided we wanted to look at these uh, mononucleosomes bound to this uh, monoubiquitin in the context of the C subunit PRC2. Um, but we wanted to be able to do better than we have done in the past 
where the lack of cross-linking uh, really got rid of, of the bottom lobe of, of PRC2, sorry. So, so this is what we did. So Simon and Vignesh got together and implement, were successful at implementing a methodology that had been pioneered by uh, Bob Glaser at UC Berkeley and tested with, uh, with ribosomes by Jamie Kate at UC Berkeley. And this, um, the idea here is to use a streptabidin, uh, a two d crystal streptabidin monolayer to bind your complex. So, so this is the concept. The concept is that you have biotimulated lipids in a lipid monolayer where they are kept um, fluid. You, um, you add a streptabidin, the streptabidin binds and the fluidity of the lipid allows it to move around and crystallize and grow a two dimensional crystal in that monolayer. And then all you have to do is to biotinylate your sample. So this can be done in, in the, the default way is that you have your sample PRC2 and you in vitro biotinylate it at very, very low level so that you typically get zero or one, maybe two license modified per complex. And those will be random on the surface. Then you bind into the monolayer and that will do a number of things. It will concentrate your sample. It will provide random orientation. Um, and as I will show you for PRC2, by being able to then wash the grid so that the only thing that remains in there is the complex that is attached to the monolayer, then uh, when you blot and you get to a thin layer, the complex does not have the capacity to diffuse, touch the air water interface and get damaged. So it also is preserved against the deleterious effects of the air water interface. So in our case so far, although we, we are thinking of trying the other way around, what we did because we had a substrate um, was to biotinylate one end of the DNA in our mononucleosome construct. So that binds um, to the monolayer we can, uh, and, and then we can add the PRC2, which binds to the nucleosome. Um, and then we, we can do um, our studies. Now you could do this without forming a two-dimensional crystal, um, but the crystal has a benefit. So the septabidin contributes to the noise, if you want, of the image. When you have a lattice, which I don't know if you will be able to see with the resolution in, in, in your screen, but it's a square lattice in here. If you Fourier transform the image, you can get Bragg reflection, um, um, diffraction um, spots, and you can mask those out in Fourier space, which basically just remove, filters out the streptabidin contribution. Okay, so uh, that means that we have one additional step to do before we do any other image processing, but after that, we, we are left without any contribution from the streptabidin. And this worked very well. Um, and this is the, the a structure that Vignesh uh, obtained bound to a, this monoubiquitinated uh, nucleosome. And I'm gonna go into some details, but this structure not only have preserved the bottom half, it was actually improved in many respects with respect to what we have seen uh, before, in addition to give us uh, the information on, on, um, on how this particular nucleosome was being recognized. So some of the features that I will mention, uh, some of them very quickly. So we, uh, Vignesh was able to extend the part of ABP2 that was modeled to include a region, an extension that includes the have a highly positively charged KRRR motif that Danny Reinberg had identified as being involved in DNA binding. And in fact, it binds to the linker DNA extending from, uh, from the nucleosome and it's stabilized enough that we can see it. Um, but then, um, so that's what I just told you. The other one is this mysterious density that is present um, when the complex is bound to a substrate nucleosome, but was not present in our cryo-EM structures, not present in the crystal structures than before in the absence of nucleosome. And we refer to this helix as the bridge helix because it bridges across from the set domain um, the DNA, the nucleosomal DNA, and the histone tail uh, itself. So this is this is a helix that the four is 
unstructured, in an invisible, in the absence of nucleosomes, but it falls and contributes to the interaction with the nucleosome in its present. And um, there are more interacting, interesting things about this bridge, uh, this uh, bridge helix, and is that it includes at one end two lysines in ECH2 that are automethylated. So this automethylation has been shown to contribute to the activation of the complex. The methylation occurs in seeds, the activation occurs in trans. So that it occurs in cis, um, we, I think the structure explains this end of the helix is very close to the active site. And when the helix is unraveled, it will perfectly reach the active site and be methylated. So the methylation occurs previous to binding to the nucleosome, but then, uh, and in fact, by the way, the mass spectroscopy shows that our sample is automethylated in those lysines. So they're right here. How they activate in trans should be next chapter. Um, maybe I can come back in real person and tell you about that next time. Okay, and then uh, one thing that we finally see really very clearly before we, we saw not so clearly is the path of the histone tail all the way from the core of the nucleosome into the active site, all the way to uh, the lysine 27 that is into the active site, and a little bit beyond. So all of this is very stable in the complex. There's, there is a path of residues that basically channel um, the, this very extended form of the tail right into the active site. And uh, if you, very interestingly, this is pretty important because if you map, um, there is a richness of uh, an enrichment of mm, mutations that I found in cancer right at the residues that directly interact with the tail or that mm, interact in the second layer, if you want, on, on that helix that I tell you that stabilizes upon interaction with the nucleosome and the, his, the H3 histone tail. Very cool. Now, the, but what is special at this, about this particular sample is that it was monoubiquitinated. How is the monoubiquitination recognized? And the recognition is done by the two cofactors, both JARET2 and ABP2. So in here, the purple, so ABP2 we see in pieces is a very extended protein with very long uh, uh, unstructured region. Um, so we, we see the peptide that is activating that I told you about. We see another that interacts with ABP2 right at the neck between the top and bottom. But now we see this region, which corresponds to very close to the end terminus of the protein that is involved in binding the nucleosome, the ubiquitinated nucleosome. So it had just, um, just a little before uh, our structure came out, it had already been identified through biochemical analysis that there was um, ubiquitin interaction motif in this region. Uh, we see that uh, it sits in sandwich between the ubiquitin uh, and the nucleosomal DNA, but we see that the interaction is extended. There is a second helix, I'm gonna turn it rotated, uh, that extends from that and that actually binds over the, um, the infamous acidic patch on the histone core. Um, so that, that uh, this extended region is the one that is involved in binding to the ubiquitin and also binding to the histone core. Remember that otherwise, all the other interactions that we have seen before involve binding to the DNA and the histone tail, but not um, to, this, uh, to the histone core uh, itself. But there's another interaction that happens on the other surface, but for the other um, H2, um, H2A um, 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 histone of that second ubiquitin. And that involves two out of the three zinc fingers that are present at the, at the end terminal end of ABP2. Um, so again, uh, they bind uh, wedging between the ubiquitin and the histone surface, but in this case, not the acidic patch, but one that has 
more mi a, a mixture of positive and negative charges. Okay, so those are the two interactions that contribute to the recognition of the ubiquitinated uh, nucleosome, a, a, a mark that is um, inserted by the polycon repressive one. So just, just a couple of controls uh, that we did at low resolution, but just to check that things make sense. One thing is, you know, that um, we, we did not see interaction with the histone cores in the absence of ubiquitin, although there are regions that are binding to these patches on, on the histone core. So if we remove the ubiquitin and we look really, we don't see density for the cofactors um, on, on the histone core. So you need that the avidity that is provided by the presence of ubiquitin to zip those extra regions and bind to, um, to the nucleosome. Without ubiquitin, those interactions do not exist. This is another, a different type of control. It's a control um, in which um, we remove the N-terminal region in, in Jarrett 2 that binds to the ubiquitin. So everything else is in there. The activating region is, is there, um, and, but you, you, you don't see the Jarrett 2, but also you don't see the density for the ubiquitin. The ubiquitin is, fairly, is the most flexible part in the structure. Without the Jarrett 2, is so flexible that we don't see it. The one on the other surface that interacts with ABP2, that one we see, but if we remove the contribution of Jarrett 2, that particular ubiquitin uh, uh, is no longer visible due to mobility. So that, those are a couple of controls. Okay, so now that we have these structures, and that the recognition of ubiquitin is done by the cofactors, we thought we will do some activity assays because there had been contradictory information about whether ubiquitin, that monoubiquitination was uh, activating or repressing the complex. But just like for the, re the truly repressive marks, the K4 and K36 uh, tri trimethylation, the, those experiments had been done with core PRC2. So we decided we will test activity for different complexes and with different modifications. So this is what I'm gonna show you now. Um, when you see in different colors, uh, the type of substrate, it could be just the wild type if you want unmodified, let's call it unmodified nucleosome, the, the nucleosome that is trimethylated at K4, the nucleosome that is trimethylated at K36, and in, in green, and then in, in this uh, kind of magenta, um, is uh, the monoubiquitinated uh, H2A. Okay, so you can see that if you use the PRC2 core, first of all, it's a very poor substrate, no matter what, but it is, there is a, a significant, statistically significant decline in activity uh, in the presence of these two modifications, the places of the ubiquitin doesn't do anything. If you include ABP2, the activity increases a bit for the unmodified complex, but remains about the same. So there's, there's a, if you want a more significant uh, difference. Now, this is what happens once you are Jarrett 2. Remember, Jarrett 2 gets automethylated and activates the complex. So that now this is a really active complex on the unmodified nucleosome. It has a lot of activity. Um, and there is a significant reduction in the activity uh, for these two modifications that are identified with regions of active transcription in the genome. But I want you to see that this is far from zero. This is still pretty active. Then if you, if you, add, um, if you add ABP2, um, um, but with the zinc fingers that are involved in recognizing the second uh, ubiquitin, you get this. It's, somehow similar, I just want you to see that when you have full ABP2 and, and Jarrett 2, then you, uh, you see this additional um, a statistically significant increase in the activity of the ubiquitinated nucleosome. Um, that maybe is simply explained by just a, a, a retention, uh, you know, the binding and um, the stabilization of that engagement by binding, that, that extra binding to the, to you, the ubiquitin. But in any case, this tells us, and this, I think this is important, that um, these modifications 
um, these two modifications, the K4 and K36, are indeed inhibiting, but they are not eliminating the activity of PRC2. But, so we thought it was, it, it was interesting to look into what modif these modifications could do. And this is, this is just front and back view of our structure with the monoubiquitinated nucleosome, but looking at that particular lysine. So the unmodified K36 uh, in H3 is actually interacting in the complex where, where it's being kind of channeled, okay, is interacted both with the protein, with ECH2, and with the, um, the, um, the DNA, the nucleosomal DNA, okay? It seems here that there's no space for, a, for, a, for the trimethylation to occur, that it will be a steric hindrance, but there really is nothing behind. So these this side chains could take a different conformer, and there is, in that case, a space for that modification, maybe. What effect it will have conformationally, I don't know. It would also lose these two interactions. So I think this is, it would be interesting to look at the actual structure um, with that modification and, and see what happened. Um, so I just want to, uh, to tell you that what we have started to do, we haven't got to the a situation where we have high resolution yet is to look at the trimethylated K4 nucleosomes. Okay, so this again, there was these were nucleosomes that were, had in which PRC2 have half the activity that it has in the unmodified nucleosome, and this is what we see. We see that the complex is partitioning between two states, which are approximately 50-50, two states. In one state, the, a, the H3 tail is engaged and it makes it all the way to the active site. So it looks extremely similar to what we see uh, for the other structures. But in the other half, there is no density for the histone tail. The nucleosome is engaged exactly the same way. The, the bridge helix is there, is the, there's density for it. Uh, there, this is just docking the, uh, the R structures from the mono ubiquitinated into these lower resolution structures. So there is density, th there is an engagement of the nucleosome through interaction with the nucleosomal DNA, but the tail is not visible. The tail is somewhere else in half of the complexes. Coincidence that half of them. So tail engaged, tail disengaged. There is something else that is happening. There are conformational changes that even at this low resolution we can see. The sun domain and the region around the allosteric site, they somehow change. And right now, although we cannot tell, uh, remember that this right around here is about mm, residue 24. So there's, there's, there's a bunch of residues that, that are there flopping around until you get to K4. And the trimethylation is somehow being read. And that leads to some of the complexes not making into, uh, not threading the tail. So I just think that there are the, the, K, the trimethylated K4 is being recognized somewhere else and is being sequestered away. But, um, but somehow the, the complex is still capable of competing in a way um, and engage and have reduced activity, but but do it. So we, we really want to push the resolution here so that we can really understand how the trimethylated K4 is recognized somewhere else in the complex and sequester from, from the active site. Okay, so this is what I wanted to, to tell you. Just want to, to thank everybody involved in, in PRC2 studies. So uh, Viknesh now has started his own uh, lab at Boulder while he was here. Uh, he worked with two very talented undergraduates, uh, Jennifer, who is now doing her PhD at MIT, and Curtis, who's still in the lab, but very soon is going to leave to do his PhD at John Hopkins. Um, the whole story uh, the, uh, about working with PRC2 was really initiated by Claudio, and Simon was the brave soul that decided to look at, at, at a chromatin template and actually... Um, you know, uh, did the work with, with not one, but two, uh, two nucleosomes in that initial 
uh, study. And Paul is, is another postdoc now working in other aspects of, of PRC2 uh, regulation that hopefully uh, will mature and I will have the chance to tell you about uh, soon after. And I did not include it, but I have a new graduate student, Trinity Cookies, that is all, has also joined the PRC2 team very, very recently, officially in a couple of weeks. Um, uh, so we hope that there's many more concerning the regulation of this complex that we will be able to, to tell you next time. Thank you very much. And hopefully today you have uh, questions. <laughs> Thank you for that real clap. <laughs> All right, so. David, that was amazing. I would probably look at your 2D class averages of histones all day long. Um, <laughs> so I have I have several questions. Uh, so part of this relates, sorry, my first question relates to this uh, domain in SANT1 that seems to be moving up and down uh, that you originally found kind of correlated with the position of the SRM motif. Um, but it didn't seem to correlate, that the SRM presence didn't seem to correlate with activity um, of the complex. And you see the, the domains yeah. of SRMs in different conformations. So, yeah, so, so in when, um, when we work without an allosteric nucleosome, um, we, the, the most, occupied a state is one in which the SPD is bent and that San Juan domain is tucked in. You can see right here in this particular structure. Um, in once we have the, so what we saw in the APL, which had been activated by Jarrett 2 is that this was, um, was partitioned between two states and that the, uh, the SRM could be there or not. So it may be that whether you activate with the H3 or you activate with the H3 in a context of a nucleosome or you activate with Jarrett 3, those three give you a different states. But, you know, I think what we see in the, in the, in the case where we, not, we don't have nucleosomes and Jarrett 2 is we, we can see that the capa that capability of bending exists and is part of the conformational landscape that can be, if you want, utilized to, to regulate activity or maybe regulate even the interaction of PRC2 with other things that we haven't started looking into, like RNA, for example. So that change occurs. It is important in the context of an allosteric nucleosome to contribute to the binding of that nucleosome. It is, doesn't seem to be of any, um, you know, um, much relevance in the context of activation via Jarrett 2. And that SRM, this, this yellow thing that I'm pointing at right now, that in, we thought was absolutely essential to have an active center in ECH2 that, is, that works, is not the case. Uh, because in the structure, we see something that is en engaged with a tail. I mean, we, in all activity assays, whatever activity we see in cases where we have a mixture, it's very hard to distinguish one versus the other. We would have to do really go and dissect it using mutations and things like that, where we can make one confirmation disappear um, and see what effect it has in activity, because all the activity could be coming from one of the sites. But just based on the structure, even with that SRM in place, we saw an active site that was fully engaged with peptide. So, you know, I, I think it's very cool that there are these elements that can exist in different conformations and that can be relevant or not for activity in different contexts and that allows you layers farther layers of, of regulation, I think. Uh, our, our next question comes from uh, David Brow. Is binding of PRC2 mutually exclusive with H1? No, uh, no. We've done that. <laughs> we haven't published it yet. No, it's not. So you, you don't you have a structure have, for it, I take it? We have a very low resolution. Uh, a structure, but we can see the H1 on PRC2 bound to a nucleosome. Yeah. And does that make sense with the structure you have without H1? I mean, can you figure out how it fits in? 
Yeah, we, we can see where the H1 goes. I mean, we have the, this nucleosome with the with two linkers and how it's, it, it's, it sits uh, interacting with the, with the linkers DNA and, and the, there's no hindrance or anything that is, is stopping the PRC2 from engaging uh, the nucleosome. I don't know if that's exactly what you're asking, but yeah. So mm, yeah. I don't have I don't have more details because I don't I don't have a you, we don't have a high resolution structure and we're actually looking at this in the context of even larger arrangement, which I that's tell consistent you. with the biochemistry I take it that it's already known that PRC two can act on um, thirty nanometer filament or whatever. Um, you know I think I would you know we've looked into modeling the arrangement of the nucleosomes uh, in the 30 nanometer fiber to see whether there's aesthetic hindrance due to that arrangement. And right now, um, I don't remember, but I don't, I, I think I would remember better if we have thought some big problem. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I just don't, but I'm sorry, I, I should remember better and maybe we should, we should rethink more now that we, in the context of that, of that H1. Thanks. Uh, Bob, you had a question? Yeah. Hi, Ava. This is Bob Landick. It's a beautiful Hi. talk. And I, I confess I have trouble keeping up with all of the modifications and what they're doing <laughs> and activating. So I, I was wanted to ask a question to see if I can you can help me put this together at a somewhat higher level. If I understood what you said in the introduction, the PRC2, depending on what it's interacting with, is capable of either spreading repressive or activating um, effects on the nucleosome. Is that sorry? Uh, sorry, no. PRC2, if it's active, will lead to compaction. If it's inactivated, it doesn't do anything. So okay. it doesn't lead to these modifications, and therefore chromatin could be expanded. Um, you know, there are. There are sites in the genome that get repressed and they get kind of repressed forever. And there are others where, that have some interesting mixtures of modification that can be switched. Um, and I think, you know, in some of these places, you have PRC2, but it's not, but there's no condens, there's no, the, the chromatin has not been condensed, or you don't even have the, the K36. Um, uh, trimethylation, but you can IP, you know, you, you, by chip, you, you can see that there's some PRC2 there. Uh, in the presence of this, so um, there's something more complex that the super simplified kind of things that we've seen um, right now, but that where we do one modification at a time and we are just seeing uh, uh, how well the complex is engaged and how well it is acting on a, on a, on a simple uh, template. But when it comes to being fully active, um, inhibited or half inhibited, what does, does it mean in the context of different um, epigen you know, sites with different epigenetic modifications? It's just a little bit beyond what we are able to do it, it's another level of complexity. So this contributes to at least saying, you know, just be aware these modifications were, which are the, they correlate with regions of open um, chromatin and, uh, and active transcription. They are not fully repressing PRC2 at least by themselves. So it has to be that if PRC2 is kept repressed there has to be other players, right? It can be that the Jarrett two has been kicked out, in which case, you know, that complex is less active and then it gets farther repressed. So that this complexity, combinatorial complexity that we, we cannot completely explain, we can only contribute with pieces of the puzzles in, in very well-defined system that we're able to track this structurally and then find some correlate, correlates with, with activity. Yeah, so I, I think I understand. So that, or at least I get the basic idea that mm -hmm. the switching is really between just inactive and active when it's repressing. 
but Correct. then very complicated sets of ligand interactions that combinatorially are controlling that activity. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Which yeah. seems to be the case in, in major uh, processes that have to be very tightly regulated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tim, did you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure. Um, I was wondering about the streptavidin crystals. Yeah. Did you ever try processing without subtraction? I can imagine that actually, because the information is very localized, it might not make that much difference. Have you ever done that comparison? You know, it just, everything becomes more difficult without, we have not, I don't think. Sometimes we try to do it, we don't do it, we don't do the removal right, and we have issues. So that because of that, we think that not doing it at all will be even worse, but I don't think we've ever tried. We have to do this even before we do the movie alignment of the frames. Okay. That's interesting, yeah. Yep. Uh, all right, two more questions. Uh, John, did you wanna ask your question? Yes. Ava, that was, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Thank you very much. This is John Deneu. Um, quick question about, so in the context of your dinucleosome, do you have a sense of the, the relative affinities between say the weakest complex binding to the tightest complex binding, that overall affinity? And I'm asking that because um, how do you envision spreading occurring? Um, in, in other words, what's the binding, what's the, uh, What's the uh, the binding, or sorry, the the uh, thermodynamic uh, aspect of this for release? You know, what's the yeah, yeah, yeah. release so, of this guy to to actually do the spread? I can see well, the read write mechanism, but but do you have? Could you paint a little picture about that? Right. Um, so we we don't have any yet any direct information on on and off rates on mononucleosome, dinucleosomes, nucleosomes with different um, modifications, the on and off of the nucleosome versus the tail, things like that, we don't. But I can tell you from the failure of our cross-linking experiment that these complexes are not very stably bound to, to the nucleosomes, that they're coming on and off. That's why the competition can occur uh, through, through the cross-linking, even when we have preformed complexes. It makes sense. No enzyme ever wants to bite and grab onto, onto the substrate. So, um, so what I en envision, these, these complexes are constantly coming on and off, but what we can tell is that the complex has the capacity to engage two nucleosomes that are consecutive to one another. If they happen to be in that encounter, occurs so that the active, uh, the, 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 the the um, a modified complex, um, a modified sorry, nucleosome is engaged by the allosteric site that will um, um, that will activate and allow him to to act to modify the nucleosome that is right after. It also tells you that binding to one nucleosome will favor binding to the other. So binding to the allosteric will favor because of the geometry binding to the substrate, binding to the substrate favors binding to the to the one next to it if it's modified especially if it's modified so um so in those molecular encounters that have to always happen between a uh, an enzyme and its and its substrate there is the possibility of doing two contacts that are geometrically favoring each other in that respect but also that result to activation mm -hmm. so that's how you know, I think the, 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 the spreading is favored in two ways because, um, but you know, it could have been different, okay? It could be that, you know, you can, you can, this has to be better than just adding modified tail to a mononucleosome, right? Because it's not just the, act, the allosteric activation of the active site, it's the geometry favors the engagement of the substrate when the other one is engaged to. Um, so there's a, there's a contribution that comes from, yeah, the proximity of the tail, but also the, the sheer geometry of engaging in the context of linker lengths that are of the type that we see in our genome. 
Okay, so so there is a match in the dimensions of the two binding sites for the two nucleosomes and what the linker DNA tend to be in, in our genome. So that's that's how I, I envision it, having this double um, positive effect that will favor the modification of a nucleosome that is next to one that has already been modified. Thank you. I don't, I don't know if you're very convinced. I cannot see your face. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, I just, I, you know, it still comes to release, right? So it has to release. Mechanism, you know, so what is the binding energy for release? It has to release. So the one thing that we, we cannot get. So one of the things you have to realize in our, when we freeze our sample, you know, there are some complexes that are without nucleosomes and nucleosomes that are uh, by themselves. In, in addition to the complex, this is, this is an equilibrium. We don't look at the ones that are just nucleosomes because the nucleosome structure is known. We don't look at the PSC2 because we've already solved that one. We concentrate on this, but there's an equilibrium. Okay, so that it, even though we, we try to purify the ones that are bound with the washes that we saw on the grid, there's an equilibrium. This thing is coming on and off. I don't have rates. The mm -hmm. rates, we have to do different type of experiments. Yeah. And, the, and the, there are rates that, are, that go beyond engaging the nucleosome, have to do with engagement of the tail and then the catalysis of the reaction. And these things, how do they match? How much, once you grab the nucleosome, how many opportunities do you have to thread the tail? How many during the on, um, on time of the tail can you modify or not? And then it's the mono, di and trimethylation, which are three events that have very different kinetics. Um, we have not looked at the kinetics yet. We have a structural framework to uh, start thinking about it, but we don't, have not done kinetics. That's a good studies. entomology to be done, clearly, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so this has been a great discussion. Unfortunately, we have to rush Ava into another meeting. Uh, so let's thank Ava again for an outstanding presentation. If you did have other questions, I'm sure Ava would be happy to answer those by email. Um, so thank oh. you again, Ava. Um, and thank you everybody for coming. Thank you all for having me. Hello? You don't see downstairs? I mean, down the street? <laughs>